I'd like to take you out for a kind of fishing trip today. And um, we're trying to fish after atrial fibrillation. And I'd like to give you some ideas what that can be all about. This is are my disclosures. Uh, all this is about preventing ischemic stroke. Can we prevent it by looking early for patients with atrial fibrillation, initiate anticoagulation treatment, and prevent the stroke? We know that at least 30 to 35 percent of all stroke patients are associated with <coughs> atrial fibrillation. We know that we can ad identify risk factors that was just previously discussed. And we also know that oral anticoagulation is probably the most effective drug we have. It can reduce the number of strokes with maybe at least 70%. We're now <coughs> looking in the, to the concept of patients with silent atrial fibrillation, those who have atrial fibrillation but no <coughs> symptoms. This type of atrial fibrillation can be ongoing, permanent, or it can be persist, uh, paroxysmal, comes and goes. There are some questions about this type of atrial fibrillation. How much is the stroke risk dependent on the duration, what we call the AF burden? Are short bursts as dangerous as long bursts going on for hours? And the other question is, is silent atrial fibrillation as embolic as the clin that one that we have uh, explored uh, clinically? There are some conflicting data on this. This is data from the so-called ENGAGE study, which used edoxaban, and these um, patients were divided into those who had either permanent, persistent, or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And you can see that those patients who had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation seemed to have a lower risk for stroke compared to those who had permanent or persistent. Still though, the risk for stroke was higher than it would be expected. This is another data from Siontis who shows that these patients who had silent or previously not detected atrial fibrillation, as opposite to the first slide, did have an increased risk for ischemic stroke and mortality. So we really have conflicting data about how dangerous is silent episodes. So go to back to my fishing expedition. Do we have the <coughs> optimal equipment to find these patients? Should we use one method or several methods? Do we know the best fishing waters? Which patients should we screen? And do we, by taking all these measures, do we improve catching? That is, do we actually reduce the numbers of stroke? Is, then, is it motivated? Is screening for atrial fibrillation something that, something that the society could um, support? Well, the World Health Organization has identified 10 different reasons when there is a reason for doing uh, large screening programs. It should be, among other, an important health problem, accepted, there should be an accepted treatment, there should be facilities for diagnosis and so on. Um, our, our conclusion who has been working with this is that Screening for atrial fibrillation fulfills these criteria and should thus be motivated. If we look at the, <clears throat> the 2012 guidelines, opportunistic screening for atrial fibrillation in patients for 65 years of age using pulse taking was highly recommended, meaning, for example, a patient arriving to the primary care center for an orthopedic uh, issue should be uh, checked with her by pulse taking to detect atrial fibrillation. We know that this has a good sensitivity to find permanent atrial fibrillation. And uh, depending how old the patients are, you will find about 1 to 1.5 new 
atrial fibrillation by doing pulse taking and taking a resting ECG. However, there is a large proportion of patients who are false positive due to extra beats, due to sinus arrhythmias and so on. And it's going to be very difficult to find paroxysmal episodes of AF as they come and go. So there are then other <coughs> means to detect or to try to do long-term AF screening. And this is just some of the methods that you can use, event recorders, external uh, smartphones or special uh, other devices, including also loop recording. You have an implantable device that will detect your atrial fibrillation. Um, we have used the <coughs> device called Thumb ECG, where there is an inbuilt mobile phone, and you can, by using your thumb, register lead number one up to 30 seconds. And you also have a symptom marker if you have palpitations. And by pushing a button, you can transmit this ECG into a website where it can be analyzed. And this is a typical um, ECG uh, detected uh, atrial fibrillation from this device. And we have been testing it against 24 and 48 hours ECG. And it seems more effective to do this intermittently than just one continuous registration. So here is some data from AF screening. This was the first study we did where we <coughs> investigated almost 1,000 patients with a CHAD score of one or more. And they did intermittent ECG screening for 10 seconds twice a day during a month. And uh, we found here 3.8% uh, new atrial fibrillation that was previously not diagnosed. So this was uh, opportunistic screening, pe people who came to the primary care center for any reason. We then went on to do uh, a more um, primary uh, screening program. So we in, uh, invited in a, a Swedish town, all 75 to 76 years uh, were invited to a screening program. So we invited almost 1,000 patients, 65% of them participated, and if they, except 75 years, had one additional risk factor, they were um, investigated with an intermittent ECG during 14 days, twice a day, 30 seconds. Uh, what was interesting here is that we found 3% of the patients had a known atrial fibrillation, but no ongoing oral anticoagulation treatment. With just using the resting ECG, we found another 1% new atrial fibrillation, and by using this intermittent ECG, we found another 4%. So totally, this screening program, for, uh, using a cohort of 75 to 76 years old, we found 8% of atrial fibrillation, and they were all due to their age candidates for oral anticoagulation. In the next study, we <coughs> increased the population, so we invited all 75 to, 70, to 75 to 76 years old in Stockholm and uh, other uh, town in Sweden, and this comprom comprised about 29,000 individuals. Half of them were randomized to no screening, and half of them were invited for the screening procedure, including resting ECG history, and if the patient had sinus rhythm, they, were <coughs> uh, they underwent this screening procedure using mm, thumb ECG. And if we detected atrial fibrillation, we offer them treatment with oral anticoagulation. So basically we found 2% uh, of the population who had a known atrial fibrillation but were not treated. <coughs> and secondly, we found with this intermittent ECG recording, we found 3.2% of 
of new diagnosed atrial fibrillation without treatment. So <clears throat> altogether we found 5.3% of this population who were candidates for oral anticoagulation. And we are now following, the, following these two populations, that population that was not invited and the population that was screened over a five-year period to see if there is a difference in ischemic stroke, thromboembolism, mortality, and so on. One interesting aspect of this was that when we offered these patients to start with oral anticoagulation, of those who had a new AF, 94% accepted uh, starting with this drug. Of those patients who had a known atrial fibrillation and for one reason or another had declined, anyway, 60% of them also now uh, accepted starting with oral anticoagulation. So one problem here is what about compliance? Can we maintain oral anticoagulation in these patients? This is now five-year follow-up data from the first study I showed from where we invited 1,000 patients, uh, 75 to 76 years old. And you can see that before screening, 40 patients with AF were on um, oral anticoagulation. After screening, uh, and after consultation, we went up from 40 patients to 100 patients. But what was also interesting is that after five-year follow-up, almost every patient was still on oral anticoagulation and that we could check with our prescription register. They were regularly picking oral anticoagulation medication up from the pharmacy. Another problem is um, participation in screening studies, we had a 53.5 participation rate. And this is what you really, really often see in uh, screening studies like this. But how those patients who do not participate, which are they? And we did a socio-demographic analysis and to the uh, left you can see um, uh, uh, you can see uh, both you can see educational level to the right and the combination of educational and socioeconomic uh, factors. And what is obvious is that um, the further the patients live from the screening center, which is the dot in the middle, um, there is also uh, those are also the patients with less uh, so with socio socioeconomical problems. So really, being far away from the screening center, having an increased rate of socioeconomic problems will uh, mean that there is a lower chance of accepting going to the screening program. So 5% detection rate, is that high or low? If you look at other programs in the society where you have accepted screening, for example, aortic aneurysms, colon cancer, mammography, cervical cancer. You can see that those numbers are actually lower when it comes to the hit rate where you actually do something. So 5% is in our view quite a high number. What about health economy? Is this cost effective? We calculated this with health economy people and using, using a simulation based on what is previously known. And we could say that <clears throat> by screening 1,000 individuals, we could prevent eight fewer, uh, we could prevent eight strokes. And the quality for this, the qualis for this was 4,300 euro, which is actually a very low cost. So it looks very cost effective. And we also looked at what age to screen. And it seems that screening for at 75 to 76 years is actually a very good um, period in life to screen because you really have a high risk uh, to have a stroke and you will have this done at a very low, at a low price. So I'll just finish with some data on can we use biological markers for detecting atrial fibrillation? Can we 
make our screening procedure more, more effective uh, by using some markers. And in the stroke stop study, we did a subgroup analysis of patients uh, who were screened, and we took uh, anti-pro-BMP, which is a cardiac hormone usually seen in congestive heart failure. And what we found that was that we had significantly higher levels of anti-pro-BMP in patients uh, with a silent atrial fibrillation. And this is a very uh, simple investigation because you can just take a simple blood sample put it down in a little machine and you will immediately get the anti-pro-BMP value. So you can do this quick blood test and if it's negative you can send the patient home. So what we are now doing is that we, are <coughs> we have started the Stroke Stop 2 study where we will use this um, anti-pro-BMP as a discriminator to detect patients with silent atrial fibrillation. So we will again randomize 26,000 individuals to either screening or no screening. And uh, those patients who attend screening, we will check the anti-pro BMP value. If it's less than 120, we will stop there. But if it's more than 120, we will do ECG screening for 14 days. And just for the moment, we have included so far 3,634 3, patients in this screening group. Uh, there were some news in the latest uh, guidelines on atrial fibrillation. And at the bottom here, you can see that screening for atrial fibrillation can be considered now in individuals with uh, age 75 years or older or other patients with the high stroke risk. And this is now a 2B recommendation. We have also had this up into our Swedish authorities, asking them if there is a reason to start a national a program for AF screening and they came with their verdict a couple of months ago and they said that as it's not known whether AF detected by screening has the same risk for stroke as clinically detected AF a national screening program can for the moment being not be recommended so we are waiting now our follow-up data from the stroke stop study to see if we can change their mind so in conclusion, primary screening for atrial fibrillation is effective if you choose the right patient groups. Detection rate is, compared, is high compared to other screening programs. Acceptance for starting oral anticoagulation in this group is high. Compliance seems to be high. And screening for atrial fibrillation looks cost effective. So the last piece of the puzzle is also, can we show that by screening for AVE, we can reduce the incidence of stroke? Thank you very much.